be focusing on what the chances are for the black stars, among others, the group in which we find ourselves. But for my blunt thoughts for you this morning, I've titled it Ghana, the mirage of political leadership and the sinking sand of our hope. Ghana, the mirage of political leadership and the sinking sand of our hope. If you have an hourglass, keep it by uh, this morning. Well, also coming up, we'll tell you about the Crystal Ball Africa. This is an annual Pan-African business event that takes place at the beginning of each year and provides businesses with the opportunity to take a close look at all the key issues that may impact their businesses in Africa in the course of the new year. So if you have a business, why not? Uh, we'll be bringing you details of that later on the show. But then for our big stories, in fact, our big story, which will carry us to the end of the show. We host the man behind the mask and leader of the new force, Nana Kwame Bediako, also known as Cheddar. We'll get into why he wants to be president and the mystique, the mystery surrounding him. All of that right here on the AM show. Of course, as we deliberate on all these issues, we'd love to hear from you. So shoot your thoughts to us in the course of the show live via the stream. And should we activate the phone lines at the end? It would actually be interesting to do that when NKB is here, Nanakwami Bidiako, to find out what you think about him. Well, stay with us, stick and stay. The news is up next with Christiana Sweetie Abochi. Good morning. My name is Sweetie Abochi, bringing you the news this morning on the AM show. Let's begin right here in Accra, where residents of race course in the Anya Soutum constituency of the Greater Accra region are worried about the activities of shipping and logistics warehouses in the area. The Landlords Association in the area say the big trucks that load and offload goods into the warehouses pose danger to residents, especially school children, and are demanding the relocation of the warehouses. Rejoice Temefa Kwesu's report. Association, they have written several letters to the municipal chief executive, police and other stakeholders concerned, but to no avail. They complain that robbery cases are even higher due to recent power outages. Coupled with this, activities of shipping and logistics warehouses are posing a danger to residents. Joseph Ekol Mensah is the vice chairman of the Landlords Association of the community. He has been speaking to these concerns raised by residents. The most scary part of his activities are these 40 footer vehicles, which are packed. 40 footer vehicles, containers, which are packed in front of the houses. One can count about four or five or six these long vehicles packed on this very small road, which endangers pedestrians, especially. School children, you have about two or three schools around this area. And in the morning, you can see parents rushing to school with their children. And uh, it's very, very scary that if action is not taken and the most untoward happens, it will be very, very unfortunate for people who are staying in this area. The person who is using the place as a warehouse don't even have a fire extinguisher in the place. And if maybe certain untoward thing happens, uh, the whole area will be put into flames. Yeah, we have written about five letters to mm -hmm. the assembly, yet we have not received any response from them as far as action to be taken against him for not using the place as a commercial entity, which the assembly knows that is a purely residential area. But they are inaction has resulted in we taking this matter to the court. If we are pushed to the wall, I think a court will be the ultimate. When we talk about security, it borders on somebody being harmed, somebody, let's say, uh, in case of an accident, this robbery, this robbery, robbery cases, 
Residents had this to say about the situation. Yes, I am. I am. I am very much in support, um, especially with the new sounds of the tracks from this stretch down from the junction there to the back there. I think there are about three warehouses in the area, almost on every lane. And um, I think the main concern is anytime you're driving out or in, you have to meander your way through to reach your destination because the place, the roads are not that big enough for them to also park while traffic can also flow easily. If, if he could uh, put in mechanisms that um, maybe the trucks can come in one at a time or immediately they come, they enter his premises and offload the goods and then go away. I think that will help all of us. Uh, there are a lot of warehouses here, one or two. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good for the community. It's good for the community. So probably what, what, what the, uh, the owner of the business is supposed to do is that he put in, uh, how do you call it, uh, safety measures. As the earlier uh, speaker said, maybe one container comes, he enters another camp, also uh, take off his goods. Three years or so has seen some activity um, of miscreants. I had a personal experience uh, about um, two months ago. Somebody climbed over my wall in the night. I think there was a uh, light out. And then he jumped into my compound and started removing uh, our driving mirrors. So they removed two uh, driving mirrors of two vehicles, my personal one and the, the uh, uh, other person's car. A generating plant that was, that was working, that was functioning. Do, 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 but they had, somehow they managed to steal it. Uh, so the long vehicles, because of recent uh, power outages, could cause road accidents. And also there's a school located right around that place. And students have been using that route. So um, maybe they have to use uh, like road signs to alert people that there are long vehicles around and that when they are using the road, they should be careful. Yeah, that's it. So, um, we have a problem over here because of the shipping agents who are posing a hazardous danger for the community, especially the school children. And because of that, on this road you see, the trot trot drivers and all the drivers coming towards race course, they all pass over here and it's causing a lot of problem for us. On the other hand, the government says they have constructed this road since 2015. But we, it has not been captured. You can see for yourself what the road is. Paramount Chief of Achodi, Nana Obombo Sura Lupura II, has denied allegations that his thwarting efforts of mediators working to ensure peace returns to Inquanta South after months of ethnic clashes and killings. He says his request for security protection to those meetings was not acceded to, hence his inability to honor earlier peace talks invitations. There's more in this report. The Nkwanta ethnic clashes have so far claimed 13 lives by official records with damage caused to several properties. A lot of efforts have been made by authorities and individuals to restore peace in the largest municipality in the Uti region. Business activities have stalled while a lot more people have left the municipality. Nana Obombo Seura Lupura II, the paramount chief of Achode and a member of the National House of Chiefs who was conspicuously missing from earlier meetings, says his absence was not deliberate but a failure by those who must ensure his safety at those meetings failing to assure him of his safety. These are what people are saying. But you see, people think that uh, when they talk, nobody should talk. And that is wrong. That is dangerous. In a meeting where you finish talking and nobody talks, knows that whatever you have said, <laughs> nobody is taking it serious. But for me, if you say something that I think it will not help, I will come out. Because if you arrange a meeting that it will be in room A, we are four people. And later on, you change it to room B with 20 people. Definitely, I will not show up. Because when you look at what happened in uh, Burkina Faso, Thomas Sankara, then when you go to Liberia, what happens there? They will ask you to come for a meeting, peace talk, 
don't bring anybody, come alone. Then somebody will go and ambush you. In that case, you will not go. Because security issues are very important. But if now that they have assured us that they are going to make security arrangement available to everybody and will have a responsible committee, that officially they will write to us that any time they invite you before this committee, know that it is recognized by the state and the uh, regional coordinating council. Why not? We'll show up. Other than that, nobody can just sit anywhere and call me, come for a meeting, then I'll just get up and walk to the meeting in the midst of war. No rational person will do that. He was present at the regional security meeting on Wednesday to deliberate on the way forward at restoring peace in Nkwanta. He shares some insights. We discussed about peace. Uh, school just resumed yesterday, and uh, the need to talk to parents to allow their children to go to school, and the need to talk to the, our people, the need to talk to our people to stop the conflict, because Georgia is better than World War. What we are looking for is development. When there is war, there wouldn't be development. Our health workers, other workers, teachers, people are taking transfer. And eventually, we are going to be the losers. And in every war situation, nobody is a winner. If you think you're a winner, then you are lying. Everybody has received his share. So we should stop. What is going on will not help us. So I'm calling on everybody, those sponsors from outside, those sponsors in the country, those sponsors in Nkwanta who think they are going to benefit out of this war, uh, it, it must end. It must end. We should rather talk to our people to lay down their arms and the need to live together in harmony and peace. Nonetheless, he's calling for ceasefire between the feuding factions in the municipality so that peace can be restored. I will continue calling for peace. It is not over until it is over. When we see a total peace, then we know we are all committed and we have committed ourselves to whatever we are saying. So I'm looking for peace. I will continue to talk to my people until everything is over. Everybody can move to any part of Nkwanta freely without being attacked by anybody. Peter Sun for Joy News. Now, the Bimbila Municipal Hospital recorded zero maternal mortality in 2023. Authorities at the facility have described this as a big achievement. They say that out of about 1,800 deliveries, the hospital did not record a single mortality. Medical Superintendent Dr. Adam Bahama disclosed this at a ceremony to celebrate staff of the facility. Bimbila Hospital established 14 years ago has over the years recorded some maternal mortality, forcing the hospital to put in some pragmatic steps to address the challenge. The measures, according to hospital authorities, are yielding results. The hospital medical superintendent, Dr. Adam Barhama, said some of the strategies include stocking the blood bank at all times and also ensuring the pharmacy operates 24-7. Mm, one of the strategies employed by management was to, you know, lace up with the lab, okay, to lace up with the lab to ensure that we have regular availability of blood. Okay, blood is one of the products you cannot get in the market to buy. All the other consumables we use in the hospital, we can buy from the market, but lab, uh, blood we can't. So through the effort of the laboratory uh, in charge, we were able to at least um, uh, mobilize some units of blood to ensure that as and when we need it, we get the blood. And that has helped. There are even instances at odd hours, midnight, 
the laboratory staff are able to get us blood and we call for it. Okay, because they have been able, they know people in town who are always willing to donate. Said, though the hospital achieved some milestone in 2023, there are some challenges it has faced, citing security as one. Sometimes our staff motorbikes get stolen by, you know, tips they walk in at any time and all this will happen because of lack of war. Do you understand that? If you stand by the roadside, <laughs> you can see for yourself. <laughs> Is that okay? You can enter the hospital at any angle and <laughs> you can leave the hospital at any angle. But if you have a common entrance and common exit, they will be able to, you know, um, um, stop some of these threats that is that occasionally happen. The regent of the Nanumba traditional area in a speech read on his behalf by the Kwanlana Tahiru Osman commended the hospital for the achievement, adding that it was a milestone worth celebrating. 14 years down the line, 2023 has come to pass, leaving behind an unprecedented record just by the hospital. No doubt, the report is that out of 1,800 deliveries, the hospital has recorded zero mortality. This significant achievement is worth commendation. Yendi and other hospitals have never been able to achieve it. So we will definitely be very grateful and be very thankful to God for giving us that honor. Away from that, the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Dramani Mahama, says government is returning the country to the days of power crisis. Parts of the country have been experiencing frequent unannounced power outages, raising concerns among electricity consumers. Mr. Mahama says a future NDC government will inherit power cuts, a problem the party had earlier resolved. Nana Yaojima has more in this report. According to the NDC flag bearer, there is a heightened call for the party to return to power due to present economic hardship. Nonetheless, John Mahama believes the election. The NDC flag bearer was mobbed by people of the Volta region at Sugagope when the building Ghana tour made entry into the region. At a stakeholder meeting with members of the NDC, Mr. Mahama expressed disappointment in the mismanagement of the power sector. He further commented on the persistent hike in electricity tariff. Today, Dumso, they are kicking it like a football. Why? Because he wants to kick it over the 7th January 2025 uh, line and hand the trouble over to somebody else. And yet we resolved it before they came into office. Today the food value added tax on electricity bills and COVID uh, levy, NHIL levy, uh, uh, get fund levy, all on electricity bills. And so that is going to send the cost of your electricity bills up. Already there was a 29% increase, there was a 19% increase, then they tried to fool us with a 4% decrease, and now it's going up again, ast astronomically. Many businesses continue to suffer due to the hike in tariff. John Mahama believes a reduction in government expenditure could help reduce excessive taxes that have resulted in hikes in prices of goods and services. Meanwhile, John Dramani Mahama is appealing to party members to, take, to be prepared to take up roles as party agents in the upcoming elections. According to him, persons putting themselves up for the roles are often not competent enough, negatively impacting the party's fortunes. According to the NDC flag bearer, there is a heightened call for the party to return to power due to present economic hardship. 
Nonetheless, John Mahama believes the electorate will not countenance a government that will repeat the wrongdoings of the present government. He explains the expectation of the NDC government if voted into power. My brothers and sisters, Ghanaians are looking up to us and we must use the four-year term that they are going to grant us in 2025 to consolidate our democracy. We must not win the trust and the mandate of Ghanaians only to come and commit the same mistakes that MPP has committed. The four-year term should be to build a foundation and a platform so that whoever we put there to take over from us who are leaving off would be able to continue and continue and continue. Ghanaians should see that NDC is always the better option. I know these are guys. If they go out of power for one term, they will go and metamorphose and, uh, you know, sprinkle themselves with perfume and tie new ribbons and come back, you know, uh, uh, with their deceptive smells and try to fool Ghanaians once again. And so our continuation in power would be dependent on this four-year term. Ghanaians are calm today because they know there's an election coming up. Times are hard. Things are difficult. And if it was just left to the natural scheme of things, we probably would not be sitting as peacefully as we are sitting here. But Ghanaians know that in a few months, they have the opportunity to make a change. Mr. Mahama further cautioned future appointees against arrogance and corruption. But they are not going to countenance anybody coming and doing the same thing that the MP and MPP have been doing. Still on the NDC, Upper West Regional Chairman of the party, Abdul Nasir Sani, is predicting a clean sweep of all 11 parliamentary seats in the region for the National Democratic Congress. The party currently holds eight out of the 11 parliamentary seats in the region. Here's Rafiq Salam's report from WA. The Upper West Regional Chief Imam Alaj Osman Mahamakani in October 2022 launched the Upper The Upper West Regional Chapter of the National Democratic Congress, NDC, integrated several key committees of the party aimed at reorganizing and re-energizing the party for the 2024 general elections. The NDC says they are bent on not only increasing the presidential polls, but also win all 11 parliamentary seats in their region to give total victory for the party in the 2024 polls. The party currently holds eight out of the 11 parliamentary seats in the region. The event, graced by former government functionaries and stars of the party, highlighted a resolute commitment to ensure a massive victory for the party in the region. Our power Regional chairman of the NDC, Abdul Nasser Sani Bonas, called on supporters of the party to close their ranks and work for the victory of the party in the 2024 polls. Unity, unity. And so he said that when the addition of these new people, he is quite optimistic that we shall come December 7, 2024, we are going to win all the pandemics and give the executive order. He is on the fact that elections are over. Let them put our individual differences aside. And Among the 14 committees integrated were the Election IT Directorate, Finance, Communications, and Conflict Resolution Committees. Our Power Regional Secretary of the NDC, Lawyer Charles Luanga Pozun, saw the appointees into office. Former Our Power Regional Minister, Ambassador Amin Amid Suleimani, who chairs the Conflict Resolution Committee, speaking on behalf of the various committee members, emphasized allegiance to the NDC's collective cause urging members to transcend individual interests and ensure unwavering dedications to the party's goals rather than individual interests. Now for our last story in this bulletin, there is a big relief for 27 beneficiaries of the Upper West Regional Chief Imam's Educational Endowment Fund. 
Out of the 44 persons who applied seeking financial support from the fund that was instituted a couple of years ago, 27 brilliant but needy students who had admission at various tertiary institutions in the country were able to sail through and had their fees paid. Rafik Salam again has this report. The upper was regional chief Imam Alaji Osman Mahamakani in October 2022 launched the upper was regional chief Imam's educational endowment fund with the objective of providing scholarship opportunities for brilliant but needed students at various educational levels in the region and beyond. 16 students were the first beneficiaries of the fund. The second window for prospective applicants for the 2023-2024 academic year was opened in October last year, where 44 applicants underwent rigorous evaluation and interviews before 27 of them came up tops and were selected. Academic fees amounting to 64,906 Ghana cities and 41 pesos has since been paid to the schools of the 27 beneficiaries. Council Secretary to the Upper House Regional Chief Imam's Educational Endowment Fund, Mumu Sedu, laid bare the process involved in selecting the 27 beneficiaries. A total of 44 potential beneficiaries sought scholarship, presenting applications for 37 distinct programs across various tertiary institutions nationwide. After thorough deliberations and careful consideration of submitted documents and interview results, the committee recommended 27 candidates as the second batch of beneficiaries for the Upper West Regional Chief Imam Educational Endowment Fund. Subsequently, distinguished members of the press, I am extremely delighted today to reveal that as of November 24, 2023, the school fees for these 27 beneficiaries have been fully settled, totaling a whopping amount of 64,964 uh, one Ghana cities. The payment vouchers and receipts have been duly provided to beneficiaries so as to facilitate their enrollment with their respective educational institutions. Women said to further reveal that the number of beneficiaries from the Christian fraternity also increased from one to two. It brings great pleasure to announce a noteworthy development. The number of Christian beneficiaries has expanded from one to two. This uplifting initiative reflects the inclusive spread of compassion and justice that transcends beyond regional boundaries. Through both financial and in-kind contributions, these individuals, organizations, communities, and clans of war and beyond, representatives of communities, political parties, Islamic organizations, businessmen and women have enabled the establishment of the fund. But like in the spirit of the well-known Oliver Trace, we cannot help but express our desire for a continuation of the remarkable failings you have already invoked within us. And that will be all for this morning's news on the AM show. My name is Sweetie Abochi. Benjamin Akako is next with the news review. Keep watching. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the news. I did, and you should expect to see more of that coming up on the AM show with Sweetie Abochi. Well, let's uh, veer now into the news review. You know, this segment is always brought to you courtesy of Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. And they are not offering you anything different from what they've offered you always on the show. Of course, there's a plethora of ailments that they can help you solve. But for this show, they're offering you free screening in two areas. If you're a man, prostate screening, that's for you. If you're a woman, fertility screening. Now, if you'd like to take advantage, which I proffer that you do, here's where you can find Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. Here in Accra, they are at Spintex opposite the Shell signboard in Kumasi, Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takradi Anaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, and Esiam Anzima. Their call lines 244 867 068 or 0274 234 321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. Bringing us to the start, 
of the News Review. Joining me this morning, you've never seen him here uh, doing this with me before. Today is his first. He's the Deputy Managing Director of the Metro Mass Transit and the MPP's parliamentary candidate hopeful for Menchia North in the person of Nana Osei uh, Bamfo. He joins the conversation. Nana, good morning to you. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Uh, was that Jesus calling? <laughs> if, if, if it was Jesus was, on the line, we can hoping, pardon you. If it was, wasn't Jesus, was hoping so. then... then I, hoping so. <laughs> I think it was my alarm that I, I had said. <laughs> but I had uh, turned it off. So anyway. <clears throat> so good to have you join the conversation for the very first time. Uh, I'd usually like to start from the constituency, among other areas of interest, before we get into the papers. Um, how is the Metro Mass Transit faring? Um, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, say Happy New Year. Since this is my first time on this show, and um, to greet my good people of Manchester North, uh, Metro Mass, my um, colleagues, my workers. Um, Metro Mass, as you would know, I mean, it's got its challenges back in, I mean, uh, this was something that was set up by President Kufo mm -hmm. back in 2003. And um, it's had its challenges looking at where it started from. It had about, uh, when the company started, they started with about uh, 1,400 buses coming all the way down to where we took over with about 400 buses being routed currently. Um, it's been a challenge uh, when it comes to employees. Because we have, you know, when you have about 1,400 buses, it comes with um, that employees that should, you know, um, Man make it. us four. Mm. And so when the bus reduced to about 400, it still had almost 4,000 employees. So that would mean you would have to generate a lot more to be able to meet the um, salaries, you know, paying supplies and, and, and whatnot. But now, I mean, uh, employees have reduced drastically, not because of, you know, people are aging, people are leaving, uh, find other opportunities and stuff. But um, currently, uh, the state of Metro Mass, with the government's intervention and a lot of stuff that's being done by the, the current um, management, um, we are turning things around. I mean, if you see on the road, you've, saying that there are new buses that has been uh, purchased by the government for Metro Mass since last year. And so we gradually, we are turning um, the company around with the new buses that we've, we've received from the government and the existing ones that we have, you know, uh, retrofitting, they're making sure that we get them <coughs> to look, you know, and then um, converting most of them into cargo and starting a good parcel service, you know, changing the whole narrative and making sure that, you know, the, the metro bus that you know, or the, I wouldn't say the bad name, but the, I think the, the, the last few years had been, if we were all over the news, mostly not for the right reasons. Right. We have changed the narrative and if you would look, I mean, there hasn't been that negative you know, um, news about Metro Mass because of the interventions and because of how we've changed things at Metro Mass now. Okay, uh, interesting stuff. I passed by Metro Mass pretty recently, um, but I'll, I'll reserve those comments. What, what I want to find out from you, though, you, I know you have a number of vehicles that are broken down, yes. and now you say there are some new vehicles. Mm -hmm. But what confounds me a bit is the fact that you're saying now things are going well or it is functioning again as an entity because you've brought in new buses. I don't know why Maslock and Ayalulu and all of those come to mind, but our problem is not acquiring new buses, I don't think. Our problem, our bane has been managing the ones we have. I felt that, that, would, that had always been our problem, so I felt you would, you would Touch so, base so when, when, on when, that because when, we get the new ones, but if they are not maintained, what happens in the next few down, months, yes, years? Yes, it's the same yes, story. Yes. But see, when you when you look at Metro Mass, a majority of the buses on the road, mm. if you check the license plate, some go all the way to 
Z registration. Right. Y registration. Mm. I mean, if you were to go to our sister um, transport companies and you see, first of all, when you go, the first thing you look at is the registration mm. because no one wants to see a breakdown yeah. while they're traveling, right? And so... If, Tell you how old they are, how old, long they've been on yes. the road. So these, these are old buses. So obviously you wouldn't get the same effect that you would if buses were new. Mm. And Metro Mass may be an exception because we have workshop in-house. And so the buses are maintained. I think that's why we're able to get the, the full life out of them because majority of these vehicles are fully depreciated, mm. which in any other uh, economy, these would have been grounded already. Right. But we make do with what we have. And now that we are getting new buses, we are finding ways to ground some of the buses that you know, would cost more to operate than to, you know, because you, you put money on the bus, something that's old is, is old, you know. Right. So you put money into the bus, it goes on the trip, and then it may not even make it to the full trip. Mm. And so now that we have new engines, part of the arrangements with the Belgian government, getting in the new VDL, or the buses that, quote unquote, the Kofor buses, mm. um, we had about 25 new engines <clears throat> so we can put those new engines into the old buses and more or less do a good body work on it and you know uh, it's, it becomes almost a new bus so it yes on the management side when you have so many employees in this industry is between four to six employees to one bus when you have about 19 to one that means mm. you know you are way over and then as a government institution, you can't just get rid of people just because, you know, private companies would do that easily because you, you can't have 19 to 1 when the industry is between 4 to 6. Right. And so it, the management parts may fall in, but <clears throat> we all know if you don't have the money to pay your employees, the agitation... But, but, but some would say, too, that it is precisely because we don't have that mindset when you manage a country, it is like a huge company. That's true. And that is why you would see, I mean, look at Harvard University. It's managed like a company. And you know, the, I went to Columbia, so. the, the overturn of yeah. Harvard University, I mean, they are raking in what's 50 plus billion yeah, yes. every year. That's, that's the size of some economies. That is true. Right? I guess that, is bigger, <laughs> that is bigger than some African economies. That is so, so you have, and it's not just Harvard, UPenn, the Stanfords, and the I rest. I Columbia, so Great. I, know, I know what you're talking about. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, one of our failures is we are not managing the country like we would a business. Yes, you would have some social systems in some cases. I've lived in Cuba before. I know what socialism and different shades of it can be. But are we even getting those bare bones right? You made the point about 19 to 1 versus 4 to 6. If we don't act practically, looking especially at where we are now, at the doorstep again, begging the IMF. Right now we are waiting. We are literally begging. Mumba yesika 600 million. Yes, sremo. Yes, sremo. And yes, our economy is going. You know what it is. I know. So uh, my, my point then is there's been a lot of talk about state-owned enterprises not really functioning. Is, is the Metro Mass unit viable? Is it still viable? with what resources we have, lean system. Is it still viable? Just, just quickly on that. It can, it can be viable. It can be, it can be viable. It can be viable, you know, because, see, Metro Mass is, as you know, a social intervention. We, we are not charging realistic fares to compensate for the things we do. I mean, there are certain subsidies that, as a company, we should be getting, you know, because mm. if you look at the buses we operate, um, the same buses that we have, you know, and a government institution as STC operates the same thing. STC may be for profit. They charge realistic fares to meet their obligations. Metro Mars, on the other hand... They are going outside the country. They are, they are doing we, stuff. No, I'm just saying. Okay. And, and they also have access, access to... to I, I know some of them, yes. at least so, for sure, go to Ouagadougou, Ouagadougou and, and other stuff. places. So they can rake in the foreign, <clears throat> you know. But we, on the other hand, focus within... We're supposed to go to where nobody is willing to go to because of the nature of you know our operations and again we are not charging realistic face we are being used as the mid, middle to lower income you know 
as you would say. But um, if we were left to try to do realistic fairs, then we wouldn't be the social, I mean, we wouldn't be providing the social services that we are mandated to right. provide. And so there, there should be some level of sub subsidy that's been given to us to meet the difference, <clears throat> so to speak. Because realistically, let's take a route like Accra to Kumasi. The same bus that other operators operate will charge 100 cities, 120 cities. Metro Mass charging 70 cities, 68 cities, 70 cities. For the same fuel. So you're not trying to break even. <clears throat> we want to break even. Once we break even, it's fine. Because no, matter, no matter how social your policy is, if you're not breaking that even, is the that, that is a policy that will not... That is the mandate for us to break even. Mm. But when you get to a point where, like I said, because the number of employees we have, you know, looking <clears throat> at the uh, cost of spare parts and everything now, it makes it hard for us to even break even. So are you, are you, do you think, I mean, just to move the conversation forward, we have to get into the papers, and I also want to touch on your parliamentary ambitions. Do you think within this year we, we could possibly break even? Is it a possibility? There is definitely a possibility. There is now, a possibility. Now, now <clears throat> um, with the new buses we've received and the way things, I mean, the, 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 the things are being managed now, there's definitely a possibility of meeting it. Because, like I said, the ratio has come down from that 19 that we used to operate to now almost under 10. So breaking that even should, should, is, is definitely possible. All right. Akwesi Kunadu is Member of Parliament for where you're targeting, yes. Menchia North. Yes. It's, uh, it's your typical NPP constituency. But then the real bone of contention is slugging it out in the internal primary. Come the 27th of January, we know how things are going to happen. Why Manchia North? And there's also the sentiment that a lot of you who are in certain positions are all trying to find your way into Parliament because you know that uh, with election 2024, it's very likely you may not get your positions back because your party would lose. Yeah, well, <coughs> I don't think the party will lose in the first place. You don't want to think it. But, but is that where, where your that's logic... Not, that's not... You attended why, Columbia. I'm sure you're very logical with your reasoning. Is that where you're seeing things going? It is tough. Going? I mean, you know, no doubt. I mean, look, look when we look at the first term of MPP, mm. you saw the trend. You saw how things were moving. You know, I mean... We also we saw the to, borrowing we want, and we were warned. We, 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 we want to be realistic. We are a developing economy. I mean, the borrowing, yes... But if you, it's being used for the right, you know, things, we, we definitely need to develop. Name the right things. I mean, we, we, as a country, when, as a developing economy, mm. I mean, the interventions that came in, you know, we, we definitely had to deficiency, a big deficiency in roads. Mm. We need that. I mean, when you come into... And work, are roads any better now? A lot better than we came in. I that's see. A, I didn't know that. I use a lot of stretches. In, I mean, the motorway is a death trap. Yes, I know, the, I know there is some work. Now. As in, you know, my fear with some of these projects, right, is starting and now funding because there are roads that have been under construction in this country since 1992. <laughs> I'm telling you. Every government comes and awards contracts. And then at some point, but at least, there is a shortage of money, at least contractor least, goes, the rain comes. and, and at, least with, at least with this, you are, seeing, <clears throat> you are seeing an end to what is being done. I mean, Pukwasa like, started, it's finished. Okay. There's another phase, it's being done. I mean, mm. there are a lot of rules, I mean, at least where I live. Okay. I've seen a lot, okay. which, is, which is realistic. We know these are not, quote unquote, the projects that have been started in 92 and, and not being finished. These are projects that have been started and it's being finished. And you, you, I, I know you've seen them. Um, not you know I've seen them, man. Of course. I mean, <laughs> we, we know. You can't, I mean, you, how can one go to work? Mm. Leave, for example, I leave East Lagoon if I don't leave before 5 o'clock or 5.30. Mm. Mm. You're stuck in traffic for God knows how long. Yeah. That is all... You know, I've commuted uh, from those areas before. I know, so I know what it's It's like. being done, and I think very soon, once it's, it's uh, all completed, it's going to be. That's, these are all things that would enhance you know, the, 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 the economy. And, okay. and to. M maybe a final point, because I want to check out my share north. Yes. To, to, to get into this, I mean, this is, is an economy that we borrowed 
we know we know what happened. What really happened? I mean, COVID. I go to US. Long, long before COVID. Long before COVID, this administration had borrowed so much. You've borrowed to the tune of what five hundred plus but, but, but billion was, was Ghana CDs. Like I said, it was being. And, and if you look at the tangibles, no administration will come and not give us some asphalt or whatever overlay. No administration will come and not do maybe something at least in the health sector, this sector, that sector. But what people hold your administration by is the quantum of money versus the quantum of delivery. It's not so much the possibility of doing this, doing that. If we even look at something like 1D1F, if we want to go into it critically, what has been expended versus what we are getting? But, but, but that, this is not a lengthy conversation on that. So, so let's, let, let, I think, I think let, a, let me pardon you. I think that. the biggest thing we, we, we all have witnessed mm. uh, free SHS. I knew you'd go there. No, I, was, I, have, I was waiting have, for you I to have, get there. I have to go there yeah. because... This but is, you know what's interesting? What is interesting? Free SHS has just taken practically a drop in a bucket in terms of the funding that... that it's, a huge, it's a huge investment. The, it, it, no, I'm, I'm actually saying that it's taken a drop in the bucket in terms of the real funding mm -hmm. compared to what we've taken for other projects that have, you know, basically been basically fizzled out. With Free SHS has not consumed so much. Whenever we go there and people talk about funding, and that is part of why our debt is. Free SHS has taken in some years one point something billion, in some years four point something billion. It's taken just a, a drop in the bucket. With, with, with the it really can't account for the gargantuan sums we've borrowed. But, but for the most part, I think. Everything was in, 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 in the budget if you, you will go there. Mm -hmm. There are realistic things that are being done by this government. Mm -hmm. I mean, no doubt. Like I said, it's, we are a developing economy. We would borrow. But, you know, we just have to be disciplined in how we borrow, okay. which I, I believe this government has not done so bad when it comes to, you know, being disciplined. And the things that are being done, like I said, we, we see them. Mm -hmm. You know, they are realistic things that are being done, I mean, the health sector. There are a lot of stuff that's been done. And let's even put this, uh, the identification cards, you know, the NIA stuff, the things that are being done in this economy. Once, once we get things right, you know, there's, no country can ever progress without anyone having uh, identification. Mm. You know, a big chunk of what we are talking about went in there. And once things are in place, I, I know, I mean, this... Not, not so much of a big chunk, but let's, 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 let's keep the conversation going. I want to save about 20 minutes for the core newspaper uh, discussion since today we're going a bit beyond the normal time. Uh, just quickly, so in about two minutes, Manchia North, why do you think you are the ideal candidate for that okay, constituency? I, I think you had mentioned earlier that um, it seemed as if people are moving from their positions to um, contest. Mm. So a point of correction, I, I contested in 2016 when we, we were in it. It doesn't mean you can't so contest that, based on different, that's what I'm saying. different so reasons not, as of now. That's the not, reasoning can be... A, that's not the reason, <laughs> because I contested while we... Not, it we it could be an add-on reason, oh. and I will say... <laughs> But what I want to say is, I, I'm not contesting now because okay. I feel that the, 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 there will be... Um, there'll, there'll be no work for you at the end of 2024, there's maybe. There's an unlikely event that, you know, the, the, our parties would be in a position. Mm. That's not the reason. The reason has always been there. I've always had the passion to, you know, lead. I mean, my background, I've been in the military for, in the U.S. for some time. And, uh, okay. Um, I came back not because, you know, it's because I, I, I chose to move back. I worked for the UN. I just got up and um, decided I want to move to Ghana. Mm -hmm. I think uh, from what I have within and what I have to offer, uh, I, a lot of people spoke to me. And then was uh, my younger brother, um, Honorable Colonel uh, Sosua Manko Den. Mm -hmm. So the three of us, Contesting now, contested back in 2016. All right. Um, what do you think has changed in terms of your chances? He beat you then. Um, be, yes. And then I, I, cho I chose not to contest in 2020. Okay. I didn't contest. And so the incumbent now beat him. Mm. The chances now, as, I mean, I don't know if you've done um, research. I think we've talked about how it's going to be tough for us to cross this head as a party. And going into this 2024 elections, the biggest thing we need, 
be able to cross this to bring everyone together. All right. We have to have a united front. We need to go in knowing that everyone, we can't even leave one person to sit back. Everyone has to be brought on board. What I bring on board and what I offer is when you go into Minciano, there's a sharp division between the former MP and the current MP. Right. And so, case in point, you know, uh, when someone calls to meet and tell the delegates what they have to offer, a candidate is telling the delegates not to come because I don't know why. Um, they would put on their um, platform that whoever goes there is going to be taken out of the album and they would not let them vote and, you know, all kinds of stuff to intimidate delegates, which I think is wrong. You know, now you do this to someone. After you win, how do you bring everyone on board? Mm. What I offer as uh, the candidate, the right candidate for the constituency, and you, you do your checks, is I have a good rapport with either side of the uh, um, whoever. There's no, I don't bring in any fashion. I go in and I, I tell people what I can do and why I'm the right person for the, for the uh, constituency now. Okay. I mean, I'm not just coming in looking at, you know, getting developments through, through the government. With my network, with my connections, I think I can help, you know, lift the, the name of Metro um, uh, Mencia North, and, and, and I stand in as the, the, the right candidate. All right. Well, let's get into the papers now, and uh, maybe at the tail end, there's one wee bit I have to confirm with you, but that will be at the tail end. So I have the Daily Graphic newspaper and the Republic Press. What do you have? Daily, Daily Guide. Guide. And which other paper? Is that uh, the Statesman? Yes. Oh, the the yes. Daily Search Light. All right. So I'll start um, since this is your first time. So you see how we do it, at least here. Auditor General transfers 9.5 million uh, Ghana cities into consolidated fund. There's SNIT increases pension by 15%. YEA will address Ghana's unemployment challenges. That's according to the CEO. Then power outages over. Uh, government pays $10 million to WAPCO. That's according to the Energy Ministry. I listened yesterday to Andrew Ejapa Mercer um, uh, with some defense of the system that, hey, this is not Doomsaw. And if you will categorize it as Doomsaw, is it the extended one we are talking about? Is it this? Is it that? Andrew Ejapa Mercer, you are my good friend. Good morning to you. Light Duma. Doomsaw. Doomsaw. It is. Doomsaw is what it is. <laughs> no colorings about for a long time, we've been suffering some of these things. So let's, let's call a spade a spade. On the back page, UG Institute develops machine to convert plastic to fuel, and occupants of structures on motorway resist demolition. All right, let me start from there. So the project to expand the Tema Accra motorway has encountered a significant hurdle as occupants of structures in the right of way of the project at the Ashaiman side of the stretch are resisting officials from marking them for demolition. Now, the contractors courts between progress and community concerns are now turning to the various assemblies with jurisdiction over the motorway to lead the process of marking the structures. The contractors who are hoping to complete their mobilization by the end of the month have cleared nearly 1.5, a nearly 1.5 meter uh, kilometer stretch to aid traffic diversion. Now, the long awaited reconstruction of the 19.5 uh, kilometer Tema Accra motorway, a vital artery for Ghana's economy started this month. The $338 million uh, to expand the motorway to five lanes in each direction is expected to be completed in 42 months. 42 months. So remember what I said about whether, what gains we could achieve this year? 42 months, 20, so that's almost two years. About one year, nine months. months is, one year, nine months, yeah, thereabouts. Four years. So 24, oh, I, I'm actually thinking of 24 hours. Um, 12 months in a year, so 12, 336. Yeah, so it's almost three and a half. actually three and a half thereabouts, almost four years. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what do you think of this, though? Uh, what strikes me at the very start is, don't we do these things before? I, I don't know whether you're getting. You engage the communities before you start the project. Now we've started the project, and contractors have to deal with communities that are resisting and now are now going to assemblies. What do you make of it? Um, I think majority of these, I don't think these projects would have just started today. 
Mm. I mean, I had the opportunity to work with, um, as a consultant at the railway, and I don't think people just move in or the government is just going to move in at this stage and start engaging the community. These things are done a long time ago. I mean, as you would see this, um, even the stretch, in someone's stretch. I mean, we know compensations have been paid to people a long time ago. But people choose or refuse to move because they feel, oh, it's never going to be done. So let me just stay here. There are people who know that constructions are going to affect buildings that they are being put up now. But they choose not to because they but feel... But the mere fact that people that, are even able to put up buildings now well, that's, when that land that's has been... been <laughs> that's, you know, these are the things that you can't blame this government or you can't blame whoever is responsible. I mean, the assembly knows this place is being earmarked for such construction. So they should not permit them. Mm. And so when these things happen, it, it, ends, up, it ends up being the, being the government being bashed because... Um, is seen as they were not engaged. But I can confidently tell you that people were engaged way ahead. They know constructions are going to be done because you and I know that definitely uh, the motorway needs an, an expansion and expand, there's definitely a plan for this. It's not mm. just a one-day thought. It's something that has been taught a long time ago. And so when these things happen, it may politically, it may look as if you know, people weren't engaged, we are just doing this. But I don't think... You don't think so? It, it, well, over time, I guess we'll get to the meat of the matter and find out what engagement went into it. Uh, UG Institute develops machine to convert plastic to fuel. We must always celebrate our own. Now, the Institute of Applied Science and Technology uh, of the University of Ghana, with support from the French government, has developed a plant that converts plastic waste into high-value fuel and chemicals for households, outboard motors, and small running engines. We know uh, the impact of that, the, um, our fishing you know, vessels, the canoes, and the premixed fuel bit. So this, who knows, this could be this one of the solutions. Excellent. Tested at the university, the pyrolysis plant, which will be installed at Osu, is aimed at addressing the increasing menace of plastic waste on land and sea and generates sustainable jobs for the youth in the area. The project is the first to be piloted in Ghana. Let me do other stories, then I'll take your quick reactions, and then you will do your papers. So, SNITS increments uh, by... 15%, but what most people will tell you is that what is inflation at? <laughs> and so uh, inflation has hit 54 plus percent. Now it's at 20, is it 6 uh, or so percent? It's come down to 23. Okay, so let's say 23%. And of course, is the pension even matching anything? But let me do those stories and then um, I'll come to you. So page 13, and then I'll go to, yeah, page 13. Let me just do that page. So the Social Security and National Insurance Trust has increased the monthly pension payments by 15% effective January this year. Under the arrangement, all persons on the SNIT pension payroll as of December 31, 2023 will have their monthly pension increased by a fixed rate of 10% plus a redistributed flat amount of 79 CDs and 10 pesos. Uh, the redistribution is to cushion persons with low pensions under the current economic situation, SNIT said at a press conference in Accra yesterday. And then the bit about the Auditor General transferring 9.5 million Ghana cities into the consolidated fund. That has been retrieved from disallowed expenditures captured in different reports. This brings to 19.5 million Ghana cities, the amount transferred into the consolidated fund during the 2023 financial year from the special accounts established at the Bank of Ghana by the Auditor General to receive disallowed earnings. Uh, those are the stories there. On the international front, ICJ hears South Africa's genocide case. <laughs> this makes for an interesting one. And Brexit has cost UK over $178 billion uh, so far. Any quick reactions to these stories before we come to you? Um, I think it's a laudable idea to have these plastics um, <clears throat> being converted. I mean, it's, this is uh, more to do with renewable energy. Um, when we look at the, especially in Accra, one of the biggest um, contributors to flooding in the whole, I mean, of Accra when it rains, is these plastic issues where it takes years, hundreds of years for them to decay. I mean, if we have a solution like this where we can convert plastics into fuel, 
that's mm. that's definitely the game changer. Mm. So I think um, this is something that needs to be. Um, um, it's it's a game changer, and we, we need to encourage this and then promote it because it's it's going to create employment for the youth. Once we have jobs for the youth, it leaves them. I mean, uh, it gives them something to do because an idle hands always find something to do and if they are being put into the positive thing it's it's good for the economy it's good for us and um reduction in the, in the dependency on on fuel every every time what's on news is how someone is not going to get a premix fuel how someone is the distribution mm -hmm. so if we have this to um, how it has been politicized and it's not something that is new. It is, it is practically, practically always yes. politicized, which is a problem. It is a problem. So mm -hmm. if we have something like this, which will solve that issue, which would, you know, everyone is going to, someone who throws uh, plastic on the floor, someone's going to tell you this is money. Right. Right. You know, so it, it, it's, it's a good thing. It's a, game, a big cha game changer. And I think right. it needs to be loud. All right. Let's get into the Daily Guide newspaper. Which stories are you looking at? You can give us the headlines first and okay. then so the, check out one or two stories. The Wasi results and um, it says Muhammad got it wrong, Minister Dr. Edichum. Mm. So. I heard him in recent times. He was saying that um, uh, the, the former president is calling for a review, but what they need is improvement. You should have seen the comments because people were asking, now improvement, they review. What's the difference? But anyway, please go ahead. So, uh, um, do I read the whole story? Oh, no, not, not all of it. We, don't, of it. we want the paper to still sell, so please, you can do a, a so, portion of it. Okay, so uh, the Minister of Education, Osei Adichum, has stated that the former president, John Dramani Mahama, was wrong in his assertion that the, remarks, the remarkable results of this year West African senior secondary school certificate examination students were due to cheating. And... Um, to be fair, I don't think... I don't he, he mentioned that, you know, some people... You remember there was talk about WASI AI-assisted yeah. answers, which would also mean that you can't use AI if you don't have a gadget or if someone is not, which also means that supervisors yeah. were complicit. You I mean, get it. I, I don't think he was insinuating that everybody who, but anyway, it's, I mean, what, what, is, what is your reaction? Well, anyway. I, I don't think, I want to, you know, state that uh, when, when, when these things are done, the, 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 the students that are genuinely mm. doing their best to ensure that, you know, they, they, they get to this point, because you, you, when you look at the results for this year, you see a lot of you know students doing very well, and so it, it would somewhat demoralize some of these students who have done, gone above and beyond to get to the, where they are. Mm. So if a uh, former president would attribute their success or the good results they've gotten to cheating. Then I, I, I want Like to, I said, it wasn't a blanket statement. It, it wasn't, but you know, I everybody. think some of these. But I have a more serious question for you, though. Um, I, I get to see them all the time. Some come here, others go to different places. The products nowadays that we are producing from, and I don't like using the word churn because it means then it's just a fan belt, low quality. But from SHS to tertiary, and then tertiary coming through here, interns, national service, and the rest. When you look at a lot of them around, and when I listen to my friend lecturers about the products they're getting in the universities, the quality is, is, is nothing to write home about. You, you, I, I can share this with you because, I mean, you're Ivy League trained. How do you, how do you feel about that? Um, so there's mixed feelings. Mm. You know, um, definitely... I've had that experience. Not it didn't just start. I've had students come to because I when I was doing my undergrad, and um, I had a student come from Ghana. Mm. I was surprised that at Colombia. No, it wasn't when I was doing my undergrad. Okay. I did my masters in Colombia. I, okay. I did. Um, so where was this? My, uh, Central Connecticut State University. No, no, no. I mean, oh, okay. That's where yes, you did your undergrad. That's where I, right. I did my undergrad. So when. I had this student in my class, and he told me he, you know, he he was a second year, and he had transferred to the U.S., and I was an accountant student. So, 
um, I was a bit shocked. You were taken aback, huh? <laughs> it seemed as if I had to pull him and give him extra tutorials because it, it, was, it was that bad. Mm. And so he somewhat would come and then almost want to cheat. You can't do that in the U U.S., you know, when someone has to open his work and then, you know, you, you cheat. It's, it's not done, not just in the U.S., it shouldn't be done. Right. And so this didn't just start today. I mean, the quality of education is how some tend to take education serious and how I think the government would always want, try to do its best, you know, and it all depends on how the students Mm. There are a lot of students who, from where they come from, where they've gotten to, would do everything they can to go through the right process to, to you know, get the quality education that they deserve. Mm. There are some who would want the shortcuts. I mean, we, we hear stuff, you know, they are certain, just like lecturers would tell you, that they, the quality that's coming through. And some of, sometimes it's, you can blame the lecturers too, because they allow some of these things to go, to go on. Mm. I mean, even in our work institutions. There are some people who would genuinely work and not just coming through here. I mean, I have people who would come and write memo and I would have to correct them. I'm like, are you really a university graduate? Right. How come you bring this to me? I would, you know. The, the, the memo bit is a death trap. Don't be pushing those to them. <laughs> they, they usually don't know what a, some but, will not even know but what the a memo is. But the thing is, like, just like we would blame, the, the system has to be, it's still a work in progress. Right. I think this twists and turns on how we would want to reshape the education system in Ghana. And I know we'll get to the point where the quality would, right now, would be we are still in work in progress. Right. Uh, we're limited for time. We have about three minutes. I want to, is there any one story, one, you want to do from the daily searchlight? Is there any story? I think that 326 to contest for the MPP parliamentary. Which is, you want to do that one, rather? Yes. I okay, go ahead. So. so the government, governing new patriotic party has approved 326 parliamentary aspirants to contest for parliamentary primaries in various constituencies of the party to select their parliamentary candidates in tw in, on, the, on January 27th this month. Mm. Um, I think the party has done very well mm. when it comes to um, this year's uh, parliamentary um, contest. I think... And you have some big wigs who are also bowing out, as H.A. Mensa Bonsu, Kennedy Which, Japan, uh, I think uh, Atachia, Atachia, Samuel Atachia, uh, among, among you know, a host of other yes, yes. thoughts. Um, it's, again, when people would have mixed feelings on what you just said, uh, they, they've been there, they need to pave way for the new um, generation to also, you know, but you also need them mm. to... You know, because you have a um, majority leader, Jose Chairman Sabons, who mm -hmm. trying to, you know, so with such rich experience, you know, needs, is needed in, the, in, in Parliament. Mm -hmm. But then again, you also have um, Honorable Afinger Markins, who is ready to take on the, um, the role as, mm -hmm. you know, whatever will be offered him. So I think it's, it's mixed feelings. And like I said, the, the party has done well. I went through vetting. Um, the process was just, you know... Uh, they are looking for the, the United Front that we need okay. to, 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 to uh, win 2024. Unlike right. how in the past people were being forced to go on the polls and stuff. Right. So I think it's a good, a good thing the party did this. All right. Let, let me quickly wrap with the Republic Press paper. IGP accuser hot as NDC's Agal, Agalga uh, confirms leaked report. I'm talking about COP. Uh, George Alex Mensah. He has hung his boots, though. He's going, he's actually participating in this. Uh, but some have asked, so what could be the consequences if, if the, of course, the report will not bind him legally, but what could be uh, the result of that if the, the police service takes him on, criminally speaking? Uh, there's also three Nigerians arrested for allegedly selling unlicensed medicine aphrodisiacs. How about the Ghanaians as well doing the same? Uh, NPP abandoned projects they inherited, that's according to Mahama. Kaswa ritual murder, teen killers cause outrage, recounting horrifying details of 10-year-old boys killing. I don't know whether you remember that story, but very gory. You can grab a copy of Republic Press newspaper to get the details from there. I told you I had a final bit for you. So you remember the convention? 
Julius Malema was billed to speak, Peter Obi and others. It didn't come off. I'm hosting today uh, okay. Nanakwami Bediako. Cheddar. Cheddar. He's going to be here. I just want to find out, do you feel on Constitution Day for that to happen, and that supposed government event that never took place at the Black Star Square, how do you feel about it? Some people say on that day we crucified the Constitution. 30 seconds on that, <laughs> very briefly. Um, I think, I think, you know, uh, the... I don't want to quote the, 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 the national security mm. would know more than I do when it comes to these things. And uh, for them to, or for the government to shut something like this down means there was, there's more to it than what we, we would know. Yes. Um, it, it, for Tick people, talk, come, people talk, coming talk. in from, uh, uh, the, one of the speakers came out and said, if he knew what was going to be done, he probably wouldn't have, have accepted the... Which speaker is that? I didn't uh, what's hear. What's the, the Kenyan Lumumba, what's his name? The, I, I, did, I didn't hear that. I listened to that extent. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all over the news. Mm. And he came out to say if he didn't know, if he knew what he knows now, he wouldn't have accepted the invitation. So okay. there's, maybe there's more to it that wasn't disclosed to them for them to even... Uh, uh, the question I guess people would be asking, and we have to go, the question people would be asking is, based on what did they grant them permission to go there? Anyway, uh, call it a lapse, call it whatever. But uh, we're grateful for your time uh, with us this morning. Uh, Nanose uh, Bamfo, he is going for the Manchia North seat. Uh, he is one of the parliamentary uh, candidates, and he also is a deputy managing director at the Metro uh, mass. For my blunt thoughts today, look forward to that. The title, Ghana, the mirage of political leadership and the sinking sand of our hope. Uh, that's what I'm going to be talking on. Before we go into sports and talk AFCON with Muftar Nabila Abdullahi, this segment always brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. Uh, they're offering you free prostate screening if you're a man, free fertility screening if you're a woman. Where can you locate them? across Pintex, opposite the Shell signboard, Kumase, Kronum Abwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takrade Anaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, and Esiam Anzama. Their call lines, 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. But what do you think about the chances of our black stars in this year's AFCON? Stick and stay. Muftar Nabil Abdullah is up next with that conversation. Welcome back on the AM show. Yes, we wish our black stars the very best. Go, go, go. But even as we wish them the very best, let's come back home and deal with the issues we have to. I'm sharing with you my first blunt thoughts for the year 2024. And I've titled it, The Mirage of Political Leadership and the Sinking Sand of Our Hope. Ghana, the mirage of our leadership, our political leadership and the sinking sand of our hope. Now, we can't allow poverty underdevelopment to be Africa's narrative. I'm not the one saying that. Mr. President Nanado Dankwe Kufuado said it recently. That was a headline recently when the President Nanado Dankwe Kufuado emphasized the need to redefine Africa's narrative, steering it away from the shadows of poverty and underdevelopment. But I ask, what have you, Mr. President, done in seven years to not make it our narrative? A child born when he became president would have attained the, the age of reason or wisdom, that is age seven by now. Such a child per Christian theology with scientific backing would have come to understand and distinguish between right and wrong. Yet I do not know whether your entire administration has learned that simple lesson as yet. Sad, truly sad. Wrong is constantly made right under your administration. So I'm going to focus briefly on a point here before I proceed. Apart from what Mr. President said about development in Africa, he also recently said this. 
We must help make Africa the place for investment, progress and prosperity and not from where our youth flee in the hope of accessing the mirage of a better life in Europe or the Americas. And then there was a quick response. Um, one divine Ankama Amikus, he got me laughing. He said, and I, I'm not quoting everything he said, but among other things, he said, the mirage is where you go for medical treatment. The mirage of Amanone is where you go to beg for money. The mirage, in fact, is where you go on vacation. Interestingly, Mr. President, he says our youth are going after a mirage in these uh, countries. Tell that to my doctor, nurse, pharmacist, accountant, teacher, and pharmacist uh, friends who are leaving in droves. Recently, a friend of mine, a very brainy woman, whom I shall give the name Lady D, told me of her entire family, including her twin sister, who is now in Canada. She's pregnant currently and says once she delivers the baby, she's also heading there to join them. Her mother is there. Her sister is there. Another sister is there. She is joining them after giving birth. A whole full-blooded Ghanaian family is leaving because of the hardship. When our president speaks of a mirage, I laugh. Mr. President, if you stop going out there with cap in hand to beg, even as you talk of your mirage-like Ghana Beyond Aid slogan, if you start doing all your medical checkups in Ghana, spending your vacations in Ghana, encouraging and maybe compelling all your appointees and cronies in office to save their resources in our local banks so you all can also feel the pinch of everything the rest of us feel, then we can have that discussion. Until such a time, Mr. President, your sentiments will remain more, no more than a pipe dream. The youth of Ghana, that vibrant, energetic, teeming mass of our future, will continue to leave to seek greener pastures because over here, in many ways and places, there is no grass in the first place to talk of its being greener. Someone is offering an astroturf economy. You are here offering us a Sakura Park with lots of stones and bumps, and you expect these ambitious young ones to simply choose your draconian taxes, which you keep adding onto every day when you and your officials live in opulence, while many of the masses cannot even get a good meal per day? Is this some sort of dislocated reality? Because I simply don't get it. If these countries are the mirage you claim they are, then you honestly shouldn't be bothered. Let them go there and be the judges of the mirage for themselves. But you know what's interesting nowadays? I'm hearing lots of people who have traveled to the West, especially in conversations with me personally, or with others sounding like me, come back to Ghana, never. It will take a very long time, even if I decided to come back. I've heard young people's family members tell them, don't you dare come back. If you come back here into this mess, we'll disown you. Can you stop for a second, Mr. President, members of this administration, and think about that? Are you living and seeing our reality, or are you living in the bubble of some alternate reality? Mr. President, respectfully, wake up. Young people are suffering. The economy is so bad, many young people are even struggling to take the next step of marriage in their relationships, owing to the high cost of everything. The less or not, they can't. To make matters worse, you keep adding new taxes. Now there's the vehicle in income tax for owners of cars performing right hailing services. Can you imagine what uh, that would do to the cost of transportation? But it gets worse. On the back of COP28, your government has also introduced a very opportunistic emissions levy. 100 Ghana cities annually on diesel and petrol vehicles. In simple terms, all vehicles, unless they use gas, I suppose. Instead of fighting the stinking, choking, wrecking ball of corruption, which has come to symbolize your administration like a cloak of ignominy, worn in a walk of shame, you are rather attacking the problem from the leaves when the roots are where you should be laying your ax, assuming you even have one morally speaking, Mr. President. This is why I laughed recently when I saw your letter directing the KPMG to look into already determined areas of the SML contract with the finance ministry and the GRA which has raised a lot of eyebrows on the grounds of due process, personal gain, a mere duplication of work, or if you like, payments for absolutely no work done and barefaced corruption. So, let me now go back to my slides, briefly. In terms of this SML contract, yeah, the Ministry of Finance has refused to grant access to the contract based on sections 11 subsection 1B and C of the RTI Act. They'll always find something to tell you. That is to the fourth estate. They admit not having reports of revenue losses from agencies in charge of the sectors involved. They admit it. 
They also say engagement with all service providers in the revenue sector, including SML, are informed and underpinned by government's policies. Which policies? The Ministry of Finance directed the fourth estate to the GRA for more information concerning the contract. And guess what? The GRA also threw away the fourth estate. Now, Occupy Ghana, uh, ignore the IPP dead bit, we are not there yet. Occupy Ghana has called on government to allow the Auditor General to audit the GRA and the SML contracts. They want government to revoke the appointment of a private audit firm, KPMG, to conduct the audit and adhere to Article 187 on the matter. This will give the Auditor General the power to disallow payments found to be contrary to the law and then to surcharge. It gets even more murky. According to the Fourth Estate, which brought the SML deal to bear, now quoting them, their interactions with the GRA, staff of the GRA, this discrepancy raises pertinent questions about the substantial payments made to SML, especially considering that their data does not contribute to the informed decision-making process in revenue collection. Despite this, SML has received gross payments between 700 and 750 million Ghana cities thus far. Now, the GRA Samuel Arthur admitted to them that SML's meters were not used for revenue calculation when he was asked during the investigation which meters the GRA used for revenue purposes. Again, quoting them, it has been the way bill figures, which is the volume that is being dispensed from the meters, that is the gantry meters. And that was what, again, the GRA staff member said. So if for nothing at all, are you not in the know, Mr. President, that KPMG has the GRA as a client? KPMG itself has admitted to auditing for the GRA. So I ask, respectfully, how on earth can you ask them, knowing the conflict of interest you are pushing them into, to do a thing like this? When one of their biggest clients, the GRA, is in this suit. How will any objective person take such a report seriously? Mind you, I have friends at KPMG. I am not in any way demeaning their work, not at all. But just as a judge with some interest, interest, in a matter would want to quietly recuse himself or herself from it. So I'm assuming you should have known better not to place this auditing firm in such a tight corner. But hey, it has happened. Why am I not surprised? Nothing done under your administration surprises me anymore. Absolutely nothing. You have hit the heights of so many negatives that I can only see things nowadays and roll my eyes like a cat. After all, waiting man no see before. At the end of this, yet another clearing will happen, I suppose, and everyone will be happy. Apart from the suffering masses, that is. We, the people, can clearly read between the lines, Mr. President. Those who choose not to see, hear, or speak any evil of your administration will remain speechless, but not for us. For the cost of silence will be much more than we could ever bear. It will be the silence of collaborators who spoke not when Amagana was stripped naked and cast out into the darkness of the forest where wild animals roamed free. There would be no difference. No. We shall speak up. Enough is enough. This charade, this circus, cannot continue. Things must be done differently. If not, doom and gloom are not far off. Call me a doomsday prophet. You'd have to be blind not to see the writing on the wall. But turning my gaze back to the supposed mirage of going to Amanone or a brochure, Mr. President, this same KPMG conducted a survey in Africa recently which revealed that in Ghana, Ghanaians turned to savings in foreign currency to protect their investments. The same currency from Amanone are preferred to our city, the value of which we all know. It had been at a point, the worst performing currency in the world under your watch, and just last year, even with an IMF program, lost a whopping 22.5% of its value to the American dollar, 24.9% to the British pound, and 22.8% to the euro. Yeah, even in terms of money, people prefer to invest in the ones from the places where these mirages are. In the meantime, we are also in the grips of an energy or electricity flux, and that's how I will end. Let's go to the board once more. In recent times, we've been told that actually we've expected to shut off 700 megawatts of our electri electricity consumption or supply. And in actuality, we've only had to shut off about 500 megawatts. But what are the other details? Next slide. If you look at our energy consumption peak hours, you would find out that these three regions are in the mix mainly, of course, the Greater Accra region as well. But Ashanti alone, 300 plus megawatts at peak hours. Central, 
100 plus megawatts, and in the Volta region, you'd be looking at between 80 and 100 megawatts. Next slide. But then you also consider the mitigation plan and how it affects our neighbors. Because yes, we claimed we had excess supply or excess capacity in the past. We don't have that anymore. So we've been supplying as well to other countries. We cut off 50 megawatts to the Ivory Coast or Côte d'Ivoire, to Togo and Benin, 100 megawatts, to Burkina Faso, 50 megawatts. You know we joke matter. Next slide. And in terms of cutting the power, some of what we've been told about the challenges we are facing, apart from the recent WAPCO 1 and gas supply and not getting paid, and now we know that some payments have been made, why did we have to wait and let people go through all of that? The TAPCO, TAPCO had one. Power lost 330 megawatts. Do you realize what this means? How many parts of the country this could power? And the claim under maintenance. Tico 1, 110 megawatts. 40 turbines. Akosombo, 170 megawatts. Transformer issues. Wahala day. Wahala day. So this is the tail of the tape. This is basically where we are. To conclude, Dana 4, to conclude, I would just like to say this. When we lay bare some of these issues, okay, we're bringing them to bear because we must know what exactly is going on with us. With this mess that we are seeing in many forms, how can we then look back and act as though everything were right in order? That is what I dislike. Let us own up when things are wrong. Who knows? The people might understand. But like with this energy situation, with the SML situation, when you just throw it out there and make it seem we are bereft of our senses, then you, you bring some of us to ire, anger. This is not a time for molly coddling. It's an electoral year. So as we look through all these fine lines, let us also listen critically to the politicians when they speak. And winnow, sift the wheat from the chaff. Because this is also when deception will come to the fore. My name is Benjamin Akako. I hope I've informed you this morning. And I hope I've opened your heart to some understanding. These are my blunt thoughts shared with you. Raw, hot, unedited, and undiluted. As always, I pray that God will bless Ghana and make our motherland great and strong. Welcome back on the AM show. Time now to tell you about Crystal Ball Africa. It's an annual Pan-African business event that takes place at the commencement of every year and provides businesses with the opportunity of taking a closer look at all the key issues that could impact their businesses in Africa in the course of the new year. It also happens to be a forum where policymakers in Africa interact with business operating or planning to operate in Africa. Africa. And joining us for a conversation on that this morning, my interest has been piqued. I hope yours has too. Michael Apalbela, uh, he is coordinator, Africa Trade Practice Group, AB and David Africa, together with Na Ayele Kome, uh, coordinator, public advisory and government business practice group. Both of them uh, joined the conversation. Of course, she's also with AB and David Africa. Lady, gentlemen. Morning. Thank you very much. Uh, since I found out that they had all had stints with French, so I'll say uh, bonjour, uh, Monsieur Dame. Bonjour, bonjour. Okay. All right. Bonjour et bonjour à tous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there so I don't create any scandals. <laughs> but um, the Crystal Ball event, they say ladies first. I, I want to start with you. Um, tell us a bit about this event. What is it? 
And how long has it been running? It's an annual event. How long have you been doing this? So this year's event is our 10th edition. So we've been doing 10th? it. 10th? Yes, we've been doing it for some time. I know now. it's been around, but I didn't realize it had gone to up to 10. Yes, yes. Wow. And we started at AV and David Africa. We started organizing Crystal Ball Africa every year since 2015. So from 2015, here we are in 2024. And this year's event is the 10th edition, like I mentioned. So it's big, it's, it's massive. Um, this year's theme is One Continent, One Market growing businesses beyond borders. So we are looking at, as you mentioned before, um, the issues or the challenges or the key things that would affect businesses in Africa in 2024. We are not looking at large businesses only. We are looking at you know, those small scale businesses as well. As long as you're looking at scaling up to going beyond Ghana and beyond Africa, Crystal Ball Africa 2024 is a place to be. I see one continent, one market. Kind of reminds me of the after. Though many countries have not got it, it's, it's not taken off, including Ghana. It's not really taken off. We are not really, we've not got to the point where we are maximizing kind of like the Agua thing as well. But this is more Africa for us, by, by us. But since this is not the maiden edition, it's actually the 10th installment. The interesting bit is this is not an accountancy firm or some finance house. It's a law firm organizing this. How, how, did, you, how did you get to this point? <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, just to piggyback on what you just said. So, it's true the the AFCFT has not fully, I mean, spread its wings yet. But we Ghana has taken a bold step. Mm. Ghana is part of the country that is uh, undergoing the guided trade initiative. So, the guided trade initiative is basically like a pilot to encourage other African countries that is working. We've actually done a few transactions. You know where where goods have been traded across, and in fact, we are we are now moving to trading in services. But okay. back to your question, um, it's true we 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 are we are we are a law firm. However, we represent businesses, and uh, we, so your business are you business consultants? Well, we we believe that it's our responsibility as business lawyers to draw the attention of the businesses we work with okay. or who who are associated with us to the things that may affect their business. We, as a firm, believe in Africa. We believe that Africa, the future of Africa is in the hands of businesses. And mm. it is second nature to us to tell businesses what to expect. OK. So that, that's an interesting dynamic, at least. He's painted the picture of why lawyers are dabbling in, in business, <laughs> uh, corporate, <laughs> corporate stuff on that level. But tell me then, um, is it a free-for-all event? Who can attend this ball? And is it going to be hybrid, for example? I mean, what, what, what sort of event is it? Okay, so this year's event is purely physical. Um, purely physical? Yes. Okay. Um, but we would have... Um, COVID by saying, yeah, my pal. <laughs> <laughs> we dealt with COVID. So um, we target anybody, anyone who is interested in business. And okay. so we are looking at also, again, policymakers, those who are responsible for providing enabling environments for businesses in Africa as well. So if you're a business owner, um, you are a professional, um, like lawyers, or anybody who assists businesses in Africa, or you're a business owner, again, who intend to go beyond Ghana and into Africa, you are invited to Crystal Ball Africa 2024. And um, it is not a free event. Uh, we are charging a very uh -huh. small yeah. amount, a very small amount small of, one, yeah. of 800 Ghana CDs, uh, okay. which is something I believe even small-scale businesses can afford. Oh, yeah. and, I um, mean, once we are talking businesses, um, they should be, I mean, this, this is a big event, major event, 800 Ghana. It yeah. kept us below 1,000 Ghana CDs. Some lunch cries, or nowadays, <laughs> lunch cries. <laughs> I know, right. And um, you will require you to register. Uh, we have a dedicated website, crystalballafrica.com. Um, Crystal, we'll please. So crystalballafrica.com. Crystal Africa, all together. Crystalballafrica.com. Okay. Yes. All right. And um, alternatively, you may call a number that we would uh, mention at the end of the interview if you're unable to go onto the website to register. But we we'll require everyone to register before you come for the event. Uh, mm. We want to start on time. We're looking at people coming in from all over the world. So we want to make sure we give you the best experience possible. So we require you to register either at the website or at the number that we we'll would give you at the end of um, the interview. Register before you can. And just come and listen, come and share ideas, um, come and learn. Network. If you're a business, come and network. Very important. 
Which countries are we expecting uh, participants from or speakers from? Great. So across the globe, actually, um, as you would know, we, we as a firm, we, are, we are operate independent offices in about six countries in Southern and Eastern Africa. We have a network, a large network of uh, operating in about 30 out of the 55 countries in Africa. We are, we are expecting participants from all these places. We are expecting experts from, from the EU, from Brussels. We are expecting people from the AGI. Um, mm. So I mean, generally across the globe. I see. Someone would have said that maybe you should focus more on Africa. Yes, you have a footprint on Africa, but since this is more Afrocentric, you would focus more on Ghana and the other African countries. But I see, is it because you also have such a wide network? You're bringing in all these people from, exactly. people from the likes of you know, Belgium, the Brussels and the rest? Exactly. So, um, so the reason why someone is coming from Brussels is because of the, the carbon the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the EU oh, I see. passed okay. or adopted just last year in May, May, I believe. Now, we realize that a lot of the trade that happens in Africa goes outside Africa, and a lot goes into the EU, and that me mechanism is going to have a huge effect and impact on businesses. So mm -hmm. we, we think businesses should get some insight into that. However, like I agree with you totally, we, we want to increase into Africa trade, so our main focus is intra-Africa trade, but then because businesses are already operating, we want them to, you know, get uh, ahead of the game, so to speak. Okay. So let's talk about this. As part of the event, there'll be an exhibition of sorts. Yes. Exhibitors yes. are invited. Tell us a bit more about that. And let me also know, what, what sort of products can these people bring to exhibit, basically? Okay, so there are, there are no limits on the kind of products you can bring. Oh, We're not looking at just products. You're giving some of us so. ideas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> once, once you're looking at, of course, going beyond Ghana into Africa, yes, you're invited. We're also looking at services. Um, we want to promote intra-Africa service trade as well. Okay. So any product or service, um, like I mentioned before, crystalballafrica.com, you may go there to find more details about the exhibition. Um, also, again, the number we'll be mentioning at the end of the interview, you can call that as well if you want to be an exhibitor. So there's, there are no limits on the products or service that you would like to exhibit. Now, apart from the panel discussions, what can those who will participate, I mean, let them know what is going to happen. What can they expect? Great. So we, one interesting thing that's happening in this, partic this particular edition is that um, Confidence, that happens to be our partner research firm. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. you're you familiar with Michael them. Koto. And exactly. Yeah. So, his, so his Michael school. Koto actually is going to give a presentation, a very insightful one, on the trend, trending sectors and products that businesses should look out for in 2024. Um, so that is, that is something interesting that you look out for. We, we have co-authored uh, um, a research paper on, on carbon trading that we think businesses will be interested in because the whole world is, you know, it's a trending topic these days. Um, of, of course, there's the issue of the, the, the networking and the, um, getting a glance into the crystal ball to see what, is to, what to expect in 2024, exhibiting your products and your services. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, just a full menu of things to choose from. All right. It's like a buffet. Eh? Exactly. A very great buffet. Corporate buffet. <laughs> African. You have that crystal ball there and you can abracadabra and all the good things will start coming exactly. out. Exactly. I see. Okay. So to conclude the conversation, uh, just reiterate for me now, um, how do people get registered? Uh, you mentioned crystalballafrica.com as one, as one word. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about that and also what number can people reach you on to get registered? Yes. January 18 is just around the corner. Yes, it is, so. just next Thursday. So you can register at crystalballafrica.com. Uh, you may also call our stakeholder relations officer, who is Grace, at 050-9411-336. That's 050-9411-336. Can you repeat that slowly? <laughs> Slower this time. Sure. So that's great. It's actually on, on, on the screen, great. but I still want you to yes. uh, reiterate. Some, some people listen without watching. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 050 336. Just in case you're writing, that's 050 336. Okay. 
I would ask for your final words, Michael, and uh, this time to conclude, I'll start with you. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, um, there's a new market, a large market in Africa, and uh, no matter the level you're operating at as a business, you need to, you need to upscale and uh, upgrade. You need to expand. So, please come to Crystal Ball, meet people who want to expand just as you are, and grow your business across the borders. Thank you. For you now. It's 18th January 2024. The place is Labadi Beach Hotel. The time is 9 a.m. Do not forget to register. And once you're involved in business, you are interested in businesses in Africa, I look forward to seeing you. All right. Um, I may not have a business, so I should start one soon, but I'm definitely interested in the business landscape in Africa, and uh, I check out a lot from there. So many incentives to join them, AB and David team. Uh, those who joined us for this conversation, Na Yele Kome, uh, Coordinator, Public Advisory and Government Business Practice Group, AB and David Africa. We also had Michael Apalbila, Coordinator, Africa Trade Practice Group, AB and David Africa. Thank you so much for doing us the honors. Thank you. All right, so stick and stay with us. We'll be back after the break and still to come. You know, definitely we're bringing you that interview with, I call him NKB, uh, you know, new face, right? Or new force. So a new face with a new force. You know the man, uh -huh. Cheddar Nanakwame Bidiako will be joining me for a conversation in a bit. Stay with us. We'll be right back. In the heart of the eastern region lies Sanoka, a colorful farming community that holds a tale of determination, resilience, and a hunger for education. But in this community, a silent struggle exists. Sanoka, with its warm-hearted people, lack a fundamental pillar for its children, a school. For years, children trekked several kilometers to distant communities to assess education. But in their quest to quench their thirst for knowledge, they get knocked down by speeding vehicles. As a result, many parents stop their children from going to school. Sometimes, Meet Eunice Isiedua in Japan, a trained teacher. In May 2023, she requested to be transferred to teach in the Eastern region. That was the only way to be close to home and take care of her aged parents. Eunice was excited when her request was approved and she had been transferred to Unoka MA Basic School. Her excitement soon fades when she discovered Unoka Basic School does not exist. I seek for assurance in, in Sawoma Dweji Municipal and I was given Noka Primary School. So it was Noka MA Primary School. That was what was on the letter. So I proceed and I had the release. That, so this academic year, that is 2023-2024 uh, academic year, that was when I was released. So right after I had to bring my document to the municipal, so when I, I got there, I had to pass by the school to see where the school is located. 
and how the place is. But when I came, it, when I met the, the, the town folks, I asked, I'm coming to Noka, and they told me the school is not yet completed. So when they told me that, I was surprised. Now we are not uh, schooling in the school building. It's somebody's uh, chapel that the person has offered us that we should be here until the room is completed. This is the school units has been posted to to teach. An uncompleted six units classroom block, a get fund emergency project. Sometimes uh, when I sit and think about it, I, I wonder, because if there is no school, so why do you then post me? But sometimes I just conclude that it's, it's the will of God. Maybe God knows why he sent me here. Because of the kids, maybe he knew I had to come around and start. So the rest will help me. So I'm just holding on to that. Sit, stand, hands up. About six other teachers posted to Noka Basic School didn't return to the community after their first visit. But Eunice Isiedue Japong was determined to rise above the difficulties and make an impact in the lives of these young ones. Let the mission begin, knocking on one door to the other and inspiring dreams, she gathered the children. With the generosity of heart, Maranatha Power Ministry offered their structure. It wasn't easy though, but I, I got help from the assemblyman and the pastor who gave us this temporary structure, that is Reverend Inti Amwa. I had help from one man called uh, Ivan Mensa. He was the first person when I came to the place. He told me the structure will be ready very soon, so don't worry. And a lot of your colleagues have been around, they have come and checked the place, so don't worry. They will join you soon. And a lot of people are here. So you shouldn't worry at all. So those people, they are, they are ways of encouragement. It's, it, it brought positive vibes and I decided that this thing, I have to start. Every morning, these learners embark on a symbolic journey to a bright future, carrying chairs to this makeshift classroom. In less than two months, enrollment increased, and so did the workload on Eunice. On the 4th October this year, I, I came, we started with admissions. And that day, I had seven ad, uh, people admitted. And we, uh, day in, day out, admissions increased. And currently, we have 107 kids. It's not easy. <laughs> It's not easy, especially those younger ones who are now starting school. It's not easy. It's not easy for, for you to get them their concentration. They are hyperactive kids. So sometimes I have to be going around, catching them, letting them sit uh, in between the, L, uh, the upper, those in the upper classes. Sometimes if I see it, they are disturbing, I just have to let them sit beside the upper class people so that they can monitor them whilst I teach, so it won't distract the class. Looking at uh, the nature of the place and uh, the work itself, the workload, <laughs> sometimes uh, it's, it's not easy, it's not easy. In this shared space, children from ages 3 to 15 sit side by side, driven by a collective hunger for education. Before we learn the newsletter, Eunice, with dedication etched on her face, navigates the challenges of a single space classroom. For now, I have not started with the curriculum yet. I have not. Because if I say I am going by the curriculum, it's sit week. And sit week, we, 
we are we and we have different levels we have different levels among us so i can't if we were more than that i can go strictly according to the curriculum but because i am i'm here alone i i can't do that you're in the class one class two and a class three and a class four and a class five classes more classes i am aware one one year and you see on the back when you Yebi aye tro ade kwa na me ni we tro no twa no de srom ti e ko fia no de srom si ye ne keji funa osuan de e se ye fe ke be se aban be ni tem na e fo na class no bi akọ ni class these beginners are practicing how to write the alphabets with their bare hands they write the letters in the sand this may appear unconventional but their facilitator believes this helps to awaken the learners' imaginative minds. We kids, we have some kind of imagination. So as you imagine, oh, this is how the person is writing, this is how the hand or the finger is turning. So as you picture that in your mind, you will write on the ground as you imagine it in your head. If you have tables, we'll be writing on the tables and on the slates, but our slates are few. Call this a trip back in time or resourcefulness. For these young minds, however, these spoiled batteries are their best bet for a blackboard. I started with the slates. Someone brought a slate, so I started with the slates. I write on the slates, then they copy. So it was later the community gave us a plywood to use as board. So we have to use the used batteries. So we mix it with uh, water and we darken the plywood to be used as board. It is time for lunch and anywhere, including the floor, serves as a dining table. And when nature calls, these children have to run to their various homes. I don't know where was it. Where's the toilet? Where did my leg go? Eh? My leg go. Who called me? Yeah. Who did you go there? Who called Papa? Papa. I quite remember one, one, one of the learners. She, she was crying. She want to poop. So we, I had to tell the senior sister and sending her the. When I realized, they just got a uh, uh, rubber bag and they they just let her eat herself and they tied it and went to put it in. I said, you can't be a fatty chiroton. Then the other said, your bread, your prawns, so I now put you a beer. Who now talk, I now put you a beer. You should talk right, a bit me as she is. They have potentials. Was uh, being with them, I have seen some like to draw. Some also they they are creative, and others also academically they are good. So I am hoping if. Uh, the, the building is ready, we get enough teachers, we get learning materials, teaching materials. Definitely they will, they will, they will, be, they will realize their potential and they will get far. As they pledge their loyalty to their motherland, Ghana, these pupils are also saying a silent prayer for their school building to be completed. But until that prayer is answered, Eunice, Helenes, and in fact the entire Noka community will continue to dream of a brighter tomorrow. Oh, yeah.